What's going on everybody? It is Wednesday, my favorite day of the week for Q&A. So a couple of weeks ago, I said, hey, everybody, don't hesitate. Please leave your questions below. Type your questions into the description below. And I got a whole bunch of them. And then last week I said, yeah, I got a whole bunch of questions. I couldn't get to them all. And then this week I hardly got any. So don't hesitate. If you've got a question, just simply in the comments down below, simply just type out your question for me and I will get to it. If I don't get to it the first time you ask it, just ask it again. And then the ones that I recognize that I've seen before will go to the top of my list. I really look forward to hearing what you all are interested in each and every week. And again, these are my opinions. This is not financial advice. I am not a licensed stockbroker. I am just a guy with an opinion who is really into sports cards and into this community of people and sharing ideas together. So let's take a look at our first question this week right now. What do you think of signed authenticated Baseball Hall of Fame plaque postcards as a collectible and investment? I think they are really cool and I'm amazed at how affordable they are mostly players from the 1970s and before. All right, so this is a great question. So there are those Hall of Fame plaque postcard things that are commonly signed and they're in circulation and they're out there. Another group that does these sorts of things or Perez Steel is, is a really well-known one. There's artwork of different you know, players, mostly Hall of Famers, and then they're largely signed. Sometimes they're numbered. There's a few different groups that have them. Uh, football has one called the Goal, Goal Line Art Series that are largely signed, and they're really cool. And and I remember seeing these around for, for years at shows, and they, for a long time, were not super popular. And I think part of the reason they weren't super popular is because autographs they they used to be really cheap like i used to go to card shows as a kid like the big card shows and there would be like hank aaron and willie mays there signing for like five or ten bucks like literally five or ten dollars so then you know you'd see these postcards sign you're like well why would i buy that when i could just buy you know the autograph from the player and then if you buy the autograph for the player, then you can kind of get whatever it is you want signed. Well, a few things happened. The prices of autographs have gone way up. The other thing is for a long time, people liked getting balls signed. They liked getting like official National League and American League baseballs. And and my Ted Williams autograph is on a baseball. My Mickey Mantle autograph is on a baseball. And there's a few issues with that. Number one, the autographs really tend to fade. Um, you know, the, the leather kind of absorbs them. The, the staying power of ink, uh, you know, ballpoint ink on a ball isn't terrific. It's, it's okay. But a Sharpie on a picture looks as good today as it did 25 years ago. And that's the really cool thing about these Perez Steels or these goal lines or the, you know, the autograph plaque uh, postcards that you mentioned, Hall of Fame uh, plaque autographs. They're really cool. And the vibrance of the autograph, if they're done with Sharpie, is, is really nice. The other thing is for years, a lot of those guys were still living, right? And, you know, and now we're losing more and more and more. I mean, we just lost Brooks Robinson recently as well. And, you know, Willie Mays is really getting up there. And a lot of those guys were losing them. And the number of autographs that they sign is ending. It's, it's, it's gonna be over. You know, we lost Jim Brown not that long ago and the same thing. And so I think that these autographs on the Perez Steels, on the Hall of Fame plaque postcards, I think they're really cool. 
And I also think that a lot of the autographs in circulation of a lot of these old timers are on things that are difficult to display like a bat or a, or a ball or fade like on a ball. And it's going to make these autographs on pictures even more collectible. So I think they're very cool. I would like to have them. There aren't a lot of things I look back at shows and go, man, I wish I had bought this and this and this. And I'm talking about in the last 18 months. I, there were several times I saw some of all of these, the, the Hall of Fame plaque postcards, the Perez Steel uh, cards, the, the goal line cards, where I was at shows and they were very, they're very affordable, very, very affordable. And I just didn't buy them, and, and I don't really know why. Um, especially the guys who are no longer with us. So I think they're a great idea. I think there's something that you should, if, if it's something that you like, you should really consider them. And that, again, is really what it boils down to. What do you like? If you like the Hall of Fame uh, plaque postcards that are signed, you should absolutely collect those. It doesn't even matter if anybody else likes them. If you like them, that's your thing, go after it. I think they're cool, and I think we should be collecting what we like. How do you safeguard your collection? Large safes are quite expensive, and safety deposit boxes or e-vaults don't allow us to put our hands on our cards. Collectors like to look at our cards frequently. Do you ever struggle with this? So I love this question and, and believe it or not, this is a question that has come up a lot. Maybe not with this exact wording, but a very similar thing. How do you protect your collection? How do you store your collection? Where do you put your collection? It, it's something I think a lot of people are curious on what others do. Now, I'll be honest with you. The, the way I do things is not sophisticated. Um, I don't have any cards that are safety deposit box worthy, in my opinion. Now, if I had a, a PSA 10 Michael Jordan rookie, you know, if I had a PSA 8 Ty Cobb T206, then yeah, they would probably be in safety deposit boxes. Uh, but I don't have anything like that. I mean, I've got a lot of cards that are a hundred to five hundred dollar cards, and then I've got a couple of cards in like the fifteen hundred dollar range. But that's it. I don't have anything crazy. Um, so to me, it would be kind of wasteful to do a safety deposit box. Plus, I like looking at my stuff. So, what is the point of having it? I mean, I could even make the argument that if I had anything that was so valuable, it had to be in a safe deposit box, I should probably sell it because if you can't enjoy it, what's the point of just having it? But that's the collector in me. So I could take you on a short little field trip of where I store my stuff and I'll do that. You know, I have a big safe, you know, um, you know, that I have other valuable things and other items in that need to be in a safe. Um, but I don't really have cards in there so much, but um, if my cards got to the point where they needed to be stored in there, I would. Um, I mean, I have insurance. <laughs> I know it's not the same thing because not every card is exactly the same, but it's a good question. So I can take you on a quick field trip. I'm gonna go ahead now and show you around kind of my, my room where I have a lot of my stuff and I'll show you a couple of the things I have on the wall that I haven't shown or whatever. Um, and I'll show you kind of how I have stuff stored, but it's, it's nothing special. But I think that though a large safe isn't cheap, I think that a large safe is worth the investment because we all kind of need a place for some important, valuable documents and items anyway. So I would encourage you to do that. I've done that. I think that's probably a good idea. Um, but yeah, let's take a look. Let's take a look at how I have my stuff set up right now. 
So my safe is in another area, but this is pretty much it. This is the room I collect, keep my stuff. I got my Jack Nicholas autograph on the wall. That's a picture of number 18 at Torrey Pines when Tiger made that putt to force a playoff. I was there with my wife that day. And Saturday and Sunday's ticket, the Saturday ticket signed by Ray Floyd, the Sunday ticket signed by Annika Sorenstam. And then I got a little picture over there of the course that we live at. And But yeah, back down to my collection. It's very, very basic. I've got the cardboard boxes with cards, the double road boxes. Then I've got a single row boxes with some semi-rigid stuff in there. I don't have a ton of clutter. I've sold a lot of the stuff and I, I've kind of consolidated down to just a little bit. But, you know, just in these boxes, I've just got a few things. Some, you know, one touches and semi-rigid, you know, card savers. And then I got some storage stuff in here. And then I've got a couple of these cases, you know, the Zion-type cases. Um, I really like this kind, but, you know, they're all pretty similar. And then I have most of my graded stuff in these. So, you know, I got the safe. I got the... The cases, I got the boxes, but it's very, very basic. We've met and heard from your dad a few times. If he was going to liquidate his card collection, but let you have any one of your choosing of his cards from his collection, which card would you choose and why would you choose it? All right, yeah. So, yeah, I've shown my dad um, a few times. You know, on the channel, I've interviewed him a couple of times. I've showed parts of his collection at times, and we have a lot of fun together. I mean, we've had a lot of fun going to card shows for a really, really long time. And there was a stretch where my kids were super little, and I was not able to be as active as I am now and as I was before that. Um, but, yeah, it's that kind of connection and, and hobby that we share and bond is great we talk about cards all the time and share ideas and share cards and what do you think of this card and i'm thinking about this card what do you think about this price all the time um, i mean we went to a card show last weekend and we're gonna be uh, it'll post either tomorrow or friday um the whole vlog from that show and and in fact i even show off one of the cards my dad bought at the show so uh, we're very connected in in our, uh, especially in our card collecting. So his collection does, it does matter to me. It, his collection is important because I see the joy along the way that he's had as he's gone after different cards. And there are a handful of his cards that, um, you know, I, I, I could never imagine selling. Um, some of his cards I could. There is one card that I, I could not imagine selling and I've said for over 30 years that I would never, ever, ever sell this card. And so your question is, what is the one card if I were to pick one that I, if he were liquidating, that I would want, that I wouldn't want him to sell? And it's a great question. So it comes with a story and a long time ago, where I mean, maybe a month into my YouTubing, um, I briefly shared this story, but I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna tell it again because it goes directly with this question. So my dad growing up collected cards. And, you know, he really started in about 1958 and 59 and 60 and 61. That was kind of the four years that he was really collecting. So when he was a college age, when he was a sophomore, junior year of college, he got, his mom got sick. She got cancer and his mom ended up passing away. So his mom passes and his family's kind of in flux, you know, he's, he's young, his brother's a couple years older, his dad's obviously struggling with it. And so what happened was his dad decided to sell the house and move. Just needed to 
just needed a change of scenery for moving forward with the new life without his wife. And so a lot of stuff went to his, my dad's grandma's house um, in to be stored during the move and stuff. Well, my dad never knew what happened to his baseball cards. He, he knew that he had cards. He knew that he never threw them out. But during this process of him in college, after he's moved out, but before he's really like an adult with his own place is when this transition took place. And so he never really knew where his cards were. So he always kind of held out hope that they were somewhere. So we used to go to my great grandma's house, my dad's grandma. And literally when we'd go over there at times, we would like go through her garage and all of the stuff in her garage and, and try to find the box that had my dad's cards. Like we had this dream of opening a box and finding his card collection and it never happened. And so he never knew what happened to his cards. Well, we started getting into cards, you know, I, again, I was, um, I was about eight, seven, eight, when I really started getting into cards. And then we got huge into cards for about the next 10 years. And during that time, we we're always going to different card shops and stuff. And so my dad grew up in an older part of Sacramento in an area called Fair Oaks. And Fair Oaks is kind of an old town that at the time when he was growing up was kind of a country town. Even though it was in Sacramento, it was kind of an outskirt where the houses were kind of spread out a little bit. And so my dad, and, you know, from time to time when we lived, when we would go to Sacramento, because I lived about 40 minutes from Sacramento growing up, at times when we would be in Sacramento, we would kind of drive around like where my dad's old house was. And he would say, oh, that's the house I grew up in. You know, we've probably all done that with our parents at some point. And so we're driving, you know, we drive by the house and he shows us the house and we drive down, I don't know, it feels like maybe a half a mile to a mile from his house. And we're driving along the uh, the main street there and we see that there's there's a card shop and we're like, Let's stop and check out the card shop. We didn't know of the card shop. Again, we, we lived about 40 minutes from here and it looked like kind of a smaller shop. We didn't really know a lot about it, but we're like, hey, let's check out the card shop. So we, we go to the card shop and we're just kind of looking around. And, and at the time, my dad was in the process of collecting a 1960 set because that was one of the sets he collected when he was a kid. And so we're, we're going through um, the shop and my dad's looking through a box of older vintage cards to see if there were any of the ones he was looking for for his 1960 set. And I'm kind of walking around the shop and I remember this like if it literally if it happened yesterday and this probably would have happened I would guess in about oh 1990 so this is 33 years ago or so and I see my dad and he's kind of like, he kind of looks like he just saw a ghost and he's going through this box and I go over and he's pulled out some cards and he's got like three cards. And, and, and he says, um, I go, why, like, why are you buying that card? That card has writing on it. Like, why would you want that card? And he goes, oh, I'll, I'll tell you in a sec. So, okay. So he ends up buying these three cards and they were all commons and he, he paid, I think, a dollar or two for the three common 1960 cards. And we get to the car and he goes, you're never gonna believe it. And I'm like, I'm never gonna believe what? And he goes, one of these cards, I, and I just got, <laughs> I've literally got the chills. I literally have the goosebumps talking about this story right now. I still have them. And he, he says, that's one of my cards this card is one of my cards and he pulls out one of the cards that he, he bought from the shop. This is one of my cards. And I go, how do you know it's one of your cards? He goes, look. And on the card, it says Mike M. And he's his name is Mike and his last name is Miller, right? Mike M. And I said, well, how do you know that that's yours? 
And he goes, that's my handwriting. And I used to do that. I used to write Mike M on my stuff, on my cards. Like, and I'm like, how sure are you dad that that is your card with your handwriting? He goes, I'm a hundred percent sure that's my card. I'm a hundred percent percent sure that's my handwriting. And it was like this crazy thing because I don't, we don't know how the cards got from wherever they were to this card shop. But it was the first time we ever really knew that his cards were out there, that his collection wasn't tossed, that maybe it was sold at a garage sale or something. So look on the screen and this is the card. This is the card that my dad pulled at that card shop like 30 years ago, over 30 years ago. That is a card from his childhood collection. Now, he was born in 1950. So this was 1960. So he was 10 years old, wrote his name on that card right there. And so you ask the question, what card would I most want? What card would I not allow him to liquidate that I would hold on to if I had to pick one card? I will never sell that card. That card will always be with someone in our family. I can guarantee you. That tells a story. See, that's the thing about cards. This is what's different about card collecting. If you go to, you know, a person's house who's an art collector and you say, hey, tell me about this, this piece of art on the wall. They can tell you where they bought it. They can tell you what they paid for it. They can tell you how they got it home and they can tell you all about it because each piece has a story about how they found it, how they bought it, why they decided to put it there. And when you're buying cards, the cards that mean the most to us are not when we go to a shop and we buy a bulk of 20 cards and it's a card in the lot. Those don't mean that much. It's when we went to a show and we found that card that we've wanted for so long in that condition and that deal that we made that day. I have so many cards in my collection. If someone goes, where'd you get that card? I go, oh, I got that card from this dealer at this show. I paid this amount of money. Those are the cards that matter the most. It's not the ones that are the most valuable. The ones that mean the most to us are the ones that have the story attached to it that means so much. And what could mean more than my dad and I sharing this hobby, this bond over this hobby that we love and that there's one card from his childhood collection. One card still remains. And again, I'm getting the chills again. That card will never leave my sight. So that's my answer. Which one of these options would you choose? In 1971, Billy Williams PSA 4 and a 1971 Ron Santo PSA 4, worth a combined $70, or a 1971 semi-high number Lou Brock PSA 7, worth about $70. Here are the two cards. So you can see on the left, the Santo and the Billy Williams, and on the right, the Lou Brock in the nicer condition. I really like this question. And this question seems very simple and very straightforward. What would you rather have? These two cards or this one card, right? The Santo and the Williams or the Lou Brock. But it's so much more than a which would I rather have between this card or these two cards. It so depends on so many things. For example, if you're an investor, if you're a person who something that's really important to you with your collecting is a rise in value over time. 
If the rise in value, if the increased value, if the investment portion of it is important to you, then without any question, the answer is the Lou Brock card. Because a 1971 card in a seven grade is a, a nice card. And there aren't going to be many more of those because the borders are so tough. The, the set is so brutal that, and the card, you know, at this point now is 50 years old, over 50 years old. So the Lou Brock is going to be rarer. And quite frankly, the Lou Brock is probably going to have the most demand. So it's always going to have a good amount of value and increase in value. So if you're an investor type, and that's really important to you, the Lou Brock all day, every day, no question, in my opinion. But if you're a collector and you want a wide variety of cards, you're a Cubs fan, and these are two of your all-time favorite Cubs, and they're really good players, it doesn't matter to you that much if the card is a little bit, you know, worn because you get to have the card from this year of these two guys that you really like. So the Lou Brock might also be a card that you really like, but if you're a collector, you could have two things you really like or one thing that you really like. I would say go with the two. See, that's the beauty of the hobby is making the decisions like this. But it's not as simple as what's a better deal. To me, what's way more important is what are you gonna get the most enjoyment from? Seeing the values increase and seeing the investment potential or seeing the two cards of two guys that you like and now you get to have both cards. It really changes the mindset, in my opinion. If if you're a collector, the low grade doesn't really bother you that much. But if you're buying stuff with the hopes of it really climbing, then the grade really should matter, especially from a set like this. Investment potential, the Lou Brock. Collector reasoning, I would go with the two cards. I think it's a great question, but this is exactly what it's all about is figuring out questions like this because it is affected by what our overall hopes are with our collecting. Is there a point in time or age you think you will just sell off your collection? All right, man, that's a good question. And I'll be, I'll be totally honest with you. It's not a question that I've even thought about at this point in my life. I'm hoping to go many, many, many more years. I know the gray hair <laughs> will fool you. Um, you know, I was born in 79, so that makes me 44. So, um, you know, I'm thinking hopefully maybe I'm just halfway through. So that gives me a long time to figure out what to do with my cards. But the question is not just about, for me, deciding when. It's about how does a person decide when is the time to start selling and liquidating. And ultimately, I think it, it I mean, like anything, it comes down to each individual. Now, if you were to decide, for example, let's say somebody has a collection worth $100,000. And let's say that that person is 80 years old. And they say, you know, I've enjoyed this collection for a long time, but I've got a couple of grandkids and they're gonna need to buy a house and I can sell my collection so that my two grandkids can each have the down payment for a house. Seems insanely reasonable to me to sell the collection, to do that for your grandkids, to live, to enjoy, see them enjoy you doing this for them. You know, if, if you've got kids and your kids are, 
you know, about to start college and you don't want them to have a bunch of college debt and you decide to liquidate some of your collection to pay for college, that is totally reasonable. I wouldn't blame a person for a second if they decided that this was more important than this, for sure. But again, that's not necessarily the case for each person where they're like trying to figure out if they want to, you know, leave, leave uh, family cards or cash or do it before they're gone or after they're gone. I think one of the things we all struggle with and we all think about to a certain extent, even young people, well, I'll call myself young for a minute, even young people like me is you don't want whoever receives the cards to not get what they're worth, right? You don't want to leave your family $50,000 in cards and then them sell it at the local card shop or at a flea market for, you know, $500. That's the nightmare that we all have, right? That's the big concern is that people want to sell the collection before they could be gone so that whoever receives it gets what it's actually worth. Because the thought of somebody ripping off our family member and taking advantage of them because they don't know what the cards are worth, that's hard for us to consider being an option. I think that there are some ways to do that. I think one of the ways to do it is consolidating your collection. Instead of having 5,000 cards, what if you, as you get older, start to consolidate down to 50 cards? It's easier to liquidate 50 cards for someone that's not really knowing what they're doing than 5,000. So one thing you could start to do is consolidate. Sell some of the stuff that's less important and buy bigger things. It's harder for a card shop or a person on Craigslist to uh, offer nothing for a Hank Aaron rookie card than it is for a box full of really nice 52 tops cards. The other thing is that's another reason why I think grading might be a good option. You know, a few people have mentioned this um, in comments before that by grading it's really easy to google what the flip says on an SGC or a PSA slab you just type in you know 1956 Hank Aaron SGC 7 into eBay and you can see what it's worth versus if you just have the cards and they're ungraded they type in um, old Hank Aaron card and then the condition is not they don't know what condition means and so another option is as you're getting older moving into graded cards just because then it's easier for them a novice to research them and determine valuation so that would be another thing to consider you know I've 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 had some people reach out to me before and, you know, talk to me about how they have a collection and they're afraid of this happening and what advice do I have? And I'm like, well, what if, you know, if you have your cards in, it doesn't matter if they're in a box in, you know, semi-rigids or if they're in, uh, you know, pages even. What if you just put a little sticker on the back of each semi-rigid or the back of each page and it just says, a date and the approximate value of the card. You just give them a little bit of a, of a price guide so that they know, oh, this one's worth, you know, as of 18 months ago, that card was worth $600. So I probably shouldn't sell it for six. So I think grading is an option. I think consolidating is an option. 
I think that, you know, putting, you know, even like the little, um, the little post-it notes on the back of the card with a date and the approximate value. That would give people a clue as to what it is. But back to the original question, and I kind of went, woo, on a tangent, right? I went down a rabbit hole head first, you know, but I think that, I think that the way that you should consider liquidating is when the money is worth more to you than the cards. That's when you should liquidate. As soon as the money is worth more than to you than the cards, then you should liquidate. Until then, you shouldn't liquidate. I am not even close to being at that point. I don't see that happening for a long time. You know, I don't want to leave my kids with a burden. So I would certainly do something like give them a list with some values or you know, making sure most of my stuff was graded or, you know, getting, getting stuff consolidated into just a handful of cards. So it's not a ton of work. Those are all things that I would certainly consider, but I mean, I'm, I'm so far from that point in my life. It, I, I genuinely haven't even thought about when I might have that happen, but as soon as the money is worth more to you than the cards are worth to you, that, I think, is when you sell. And there's not a right answer for that. There's not a wrong answer for that. I don't think that you're making a bad decision. I don't think that there's anything wrong with you if you're 58 years old and you say, you know what, this was a lot of fun. I think I'm gonna sell my cards now and I'm gonna do something else with the money. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But if the cards mean more to you than the money, then don't sell. But if the money means more than the cards, don't hang on to the cards just because you think you should. Do what's best at that time for you and your situation. And as long as you're doing what makes you happy, don't look back with regret. Just go forward and have, have fun with it. So that was a fun week. Those were some great questions. I really enjoyed sharing that story with you about my dad's find at the card shop 30 something years ago. If you have a question for me for an upcoming episode, again, don't hesitate. If you have a question and you're not asking it, it's possible that I'm not getting enough questions to even fill next week. So who knows? I mean, I think this week I had like five questions. I think that was just about it. So don't hesitate to ask. If I don't get to it, just forgive me, ask it again. And I look forward to seeing what everybody has to say and what you're interested in hearing me talk about for next week down below in the comments. I look forward to it. And don't forget, you can also let me know how I did with my comments. Would you agree with, would you disagree with? Let me know.